celebrate the festival of the Holy Trinity, therefore we have that really long creed, the Athanasian Creed, where it kind of details what the Holy Trinity is all about, everything else in the personal work of Jesus. But we're not going to deal so much with the, the mystery of the Trinity, with understanding and explaining it, because we're really going to tackle two important questions here today, and that is, why does the Holy Trinity exist, and for whom? Does the Trinity exist? And then what does that actually mean for you? And there's some amazing news with regards to that. And that'll be the focus of our sermon then here this morning. So we begin our worship then as we sing a Trinitarian hymn, hymn 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. <coughs> God did not matter, 
and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt, and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. I am sorry for all of this, and ask for grace. I want to do better. God, be merciful to you, and strengthen your faith. Amen. Instead of by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And by the congregation, then, please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity in the undivided unity. Let us give glory to Him because He has shown His mercy to us. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith, and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated then for our readings. The Old Testament reading then for this festival of the Holy Trinity is taken from the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, all of chapter 1 and the start here of chapter 2, where we're going to look at the creation of the world, everything. We're going to see how God made it by the power of His Word in six 24-hour days, not through billions of years. And everything was done and it was finished and it was very good at the end of the sixth day. And God rested on the seventh day. But the most important thing is this relates to the Holy Trinity. We so often think kind of this Trinity thing is something that gets fleshed out until we get to the New Testament, especially our Gospel reading here today. For the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus tells us to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're going to see right out of the gate from Genesis chapter 1, God the Father is there creating. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is hovering over the waters. And it's the Word of God, the speech. John tells us in John 1, that's Jesus. Because he goes right back to Genesis. All three persons are there from the Trinity. And then when it comes to the creation of man, we're going to get a chance to see with the pronouns that are used. How this all shakes out. That within the one person, right from the beginning, God understands himself and knows himself as Trinity. Because that's just the reality of who God is. And we'll see that when we get to it halfway through Genesis chapter 1. So we begin here with the account of creation from Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said that the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called sea. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. 
And God said, Let there be light to the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be light to the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures. And every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds. And every winged bird, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth, according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then here's where we get to it. Notice the pronouns over the next couple of verses that are used here in 26 and 27. And especially we, we've heard, and God said over and over again. That's the word of God. Who's that? That's Jesus. We have God the Father, we've got the Spirit, now we've got God speaking. That's the Word, John says. That's Jesus. We've got all three persons here in the Trinity. But the word in Hebrew here that's used for God says one, because it doesn't say then the God said, plural, it's one. But it's one, but consisting of more than one. Which is very interesting. It, it, and, and we'll see that play out here in the pronouns that are used. As God makes man. Alright? And we get here to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Look at the pronouns. Us, our, our. Singular or plural? Plural. Let us make man in our image. Then God said, one, but consisting of more than one. We see here, because... All three are here. The Father, the Spirit, the Word, Jesus. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. Notice the pronouns now in 27. God's trying to get across. He's one, but yet three persons within the one God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Pronouns, his, he, he, singular or plural. Now it's singular. So showing this mystery here of the Trinity. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. It's not evolution. God makes everything in the six 24-hour days. It's actually in the third commandment. You don't believe, if you don't believe in Genesis, believe in an Exodus. Because when it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it says, for God created the world in six 24-hour days, and on the seventh 24-hour day, he rested. So you'll work for six days and rest on the seventh day. God saw everything that he made in those six days, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, done, all the host of them, because everything's made according to its kind. And on the seventh day, just so you're... Making sure he understand it, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Genesis 1 deals with the Trinity. Now we're going to get to where we were last week in Pentecost, going back to Acts 2 and taking a portion of Peter's sermon here that deals with now the person and work of Jesus. And the Athanasian Creed in the first part, we'll confess in a moment, nails down the Trinity. And then the second part, it nails down the person and work of Christ. And here Peter's going to tell us, this man Jesus is also God. He's Lord. He's Christ. How do we know that? God raised him up for all witnesses through his resurrection. He's defeated sin, death, and the devil. And God has now told us that he is the same Lord that we had in our intro here today from the Psalms that David was talking about. And Peter's going to go right to our intro, our psalm here today as well, to remind us that even in the Old Testament, David knew of the Jesus who was coming, and it was God coming down to earth. So we hear then these words from Peter, from Acts 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. That's Jesus, who's God. For he said, my right hand, they may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One, that's Jesus, see corruption. You made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers. I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, there's the Trinity. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, the Father said to the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But, congregation, please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt, which shows already they recognized that Jesus is God after the resurrection. What Thomas said, my Lord and my God, when he saw him a week after Easter. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of God, the one God, not names, singular, name, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. I'd like the congregation to be seated as we're going to confess the Athanasian Creed. A little bit long, so we're not going to have you stand during the whole thing. Now, just a reminder, Athanasius, a bishop, did not write the Athanasian Creed. It's named after him because he was a staunch defender of the doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, from which we get the Nicene Creed. And there's two big defenders of the doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea. One is Bishop Athanasius. The other is the guy who comes down your, your chimney every Christmas Eve. You know him as Santa Claus, but he was really known as St. Nicholas. And those two guys, Athanasius is the guy for whom this creed is named after because it nails down who the Trinity is in the first part and then who Jesus is in the second part and then what it is you have to believe in order to to be saved. So we'll recite this here back and forth responsibly. Whoever desires to be saved must above all 
hold the Catholic, that is the universal Christian faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one. The glory equal, the majesty of eternal. Such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord. And that's so important in our gospel reading today. I don't have time to bring it up in the sermon. But by putting that Greek word, the, that, that article, that definite article in front of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is telling us, the Father is different than the Son, who's different than the Holy Spirit. It's not baptizing the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three different people. And that's what the Creed Confession is. It's where it gets it from. They're distinct. So just as we are compelled by the Christian faith to acknowledge each distinct person is God and Lord, so we are also prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the Incarnation, that God took on our human flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God begotten, which means He's of the essence, the same essence, from the substance of the Father, from eternity, before all ages. And He is man, born from the substance of His mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to His divinity, less than the Father with respect to His humanity. Although He is God and man, He is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Who suffered for our salvation, descended from hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And at his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. We continue then as we sing our hymn of the day, another Trinitarian hymn. 
in 504, Father Most Holy. Exists completely for himself. 
That God only lives for Himself. That God only thinks about Himself. That God only talks to Himself. Why? Because that's how we look at life. We exist for ourselves. We live for ourselves. We think only for ourselves. Plus, we believe if there is a God, well, He's way up there somewhere in Never Never Land. And you know what? We're way down here on earth. And God, He's not going to be willing to come down and get messed up with this messy, messed up world. I mean, that would just be way too dicey on God's part. And so if you're interested in God at all, you're going to have to find a way to actually go up to Him. I mean, how many times have you heard it before? Ah, I know you're in a mess, George, but you're going to have to find a way to go to God. Or you just need to, to give your heart or your life or, or whatever it is to God way up there and then maybe he'll solve the problem for you. And so up, up and away people try to go. They try to desperately get up to God because God is not going to come down to them. But what a pathetic and worthless God that is. It's no wonder that so many people today get burned out on so-called religion. That's the way God's going to act? If He's just going to blow me off? I got no time for it. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with Him either. But I have some really good news for you here this morning. And I pray that this good news will actually give you some incredible comfort and great joy. The good news is this the triune God, the three in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, exists for you. He lives for you. And you, believe it or not, is what he is concerned about. His love is not for himself. Let me run that by you once again, especially now as we have entered into the days of June, also now known as Pride Month. And that is, God's love is not himself. We just talked about it in Bible study. We looked at Proverbs 6, the de seven deadly sins. What's the first sin? Haughty eyes. Pride. Forget the sexual nature of the whole thing in the whole month. Just look at the title of it. Pride Month. It's all about me. But God doesn't exist for himself. His love is not for himself. His love is for you. Jesus said, I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you and to give up my life for your life. His love is for you. You don't go to him. He comes to you. You don't give yourself to him. He gives all of himself to you. That's Jesus. That's God. With his birth, with his baptism, with his death, with his resurrection, with his ascension... He's cracked heaven wide open for you now. For you. And the Nicene Creed puts it so perfectly. I know we read the long Athanasian Creed here today, but I just want to go to the Nicene Creed. Because in one sentence, it answers the question for us today. And that is, why does the Trinity exist? And for whom does the Trinity exist? The Nicene Creed says, who for us Men. Now that's, that's very interesting because right there people will run around today in our modern world and say, see I would have nothing to do with that Christianity. What a male chauvinistic religion. Jesus only came to save men. Well, that's why we've got Genesis chapter 1 here today in our Old Testament reading. God makes all the animals, everything, the trees, the plants, everything is all made according to its kind. And then we get to day 6 and the ultimate thing God creates is what? Mankind in his own image. That's what we are. Who for us men? You better be a part of mankind, otherwise you're not going to be saved. And then what does God say? Underneath mankind, he made them, and here's some good application for Pride Month too, he makes them male and female. There aren't 750 genders. God makes them under mankind, male and female. Who for us men, and here's why he came? 
and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. It's incredible. Right there in the creeds, we say Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you're reciting that the, the creeds all about the triune God. He came for you. And guess what? You didn't even have to ask. You didn't have to whip out your phone and dial 911. I don't know if that worked to you, God. Maybe you have to dial 111 on Trinity Sunday. And then maybe, maybe you would get God. But you didn't have to. Because you never would have anyway. You wouldn't and you can't because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You can't go to him. That's why he has to come to you. And he comes to you in the second person of the Trinity. God in the flesh. Jesus of Nazareth, this man attested to you, Peter says in Acts 2, by all these incredible signs and miracles and wonders, and ultimately through his resurrection, he says, we're all witnesses of the fact. The fact now that you're forgiven, death has been crushed. Satan's head is crushed once and for all. And new life now is yours forever. Where before you had a negative relationship with God, now you have a positive one. There's, there's now a total 180 in your relationship because of Jesus. Your relationship is no longer one of wrath and damnation, but it's one of mercy and forgiveness. That's why we're reading Romans chapter 1 here today in Bible study. We've got to call, as Luther says, a true theologian of the cross always calls a thing what it is. You call sin, sin. We don't put it under pride month that everything's okay. Whatever sin it might be. Because then you don't need repentance and you don't need Christ. Pride month is actually the most unloving thing we could ever come up with on the face of the earth. Because it takes people outside of the grace of Christ. Of why he came. For love and mercy and forgiveness. And that you're no longer alienated from God because of your pride. You're now reconciled to him through Christ. Because the triune God exists and lives only for you and for your benefit. He has got the greatest benefit plan on the face of the earth. When you, when you get a new job, one of the first things that you look at, yes, what are they going to pay me? But then the second thing that you look at is, what are the benefits? And, and you look at that, what's my health care, retirement, how many days off, vacation, yada, yada, yada. And you look at that, and most of us know after year two, three, four, and five, that our benefits always aren't as good as what they were seemingly going to be when we started the job. And now we're in the midst of another long presidential campaign again. And each candidate's going to get up and say, if you vote for me, here's the benefits of what you're going to get. And we all know that 95% of what they say, we ain't going to see. But God comes along and he says, I've got the greatest benefit plan ever. And I'm actually going to see to it that you actually receive those benefits. How? That's where we go to our gospel reading here today from Matthew 28, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me by God the Father. I'm in charge now of everything. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything I have commanded you, and behold, surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus says, make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The triune name of God. In holy baptism, God gives you something. And what does He give to you? He gives you His name. God's a giver God. And He's always wanting to give. And He's extravagant with His giving. And what an outstanding gift he actually gives to us in baptism, and it's one that's so often overlooked and forgotten about. He gives you his name. It's, it's actually the greatest gift God could ever give to you, because enclosed in that gift is every other gift, because Jesus plus nothing, God plus nothing, equals everything. If you've got God, you've got everything that you need now, and for the rest of eternity. Because when you get the name of God, that actually gives you access to God and all the benefits that he has. Let me show you how this works here this morning. If somebody who didn't know me came up to me and kept yelling, trying to get my attention, 
by saying, hey you, I'll be honest with you, I probably am not going to respond. But if I came up to that person and I introduced myself to them, and I gave them my name, and said, hello, my name is Eric Omeyer, nice to meet you, they now can address me by name, which means they now have access to me. They know me personally. And they can ask me for help. And I might even be able to help them. And in baptism, God gave you something even greater than that. He gave you His Holy Name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you now have complete and total access to Him by being able to call upon that name. That name is so important that it finds its way into the Lord's Prayer. It finds its way into the Ten Commandments. We'll pray in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. The second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. There, there, there's something very important here with his name. So let's, let's push on this name thing here a little bit this morning. In holy baptism, Jesus says, you receive the triune name of God. And are you ready for this? He goes on to say, it's so often overlooked in this, by receiving the name of God, God is giving himself to you. Because he explains what having the name of God means in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching, and then he says, here's what it means. Behold, this is what it means. I am the name of God. God is with you always. Even to the end of the age. I am the name of God. I am is with you always. The tri Jesus is connecting the Old Testament name of God to the Trinity. Same God, beginning to end. I'm there. Always, completely. With all my gifts. With all the Good Friday benefits of life, salvation, mercy, and forgiveness. Because after all, what would Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. God is there in the midst of me. That's the huge take-home point of all this here this morning on Trinity Sunday. By giving you the triune name of God, God is there for you. Or you could put it another way here this morning. You now have him as your God. He's all yours, and he's all there for you. He exists, acts, loves, lives for you. And think about how this is all connected every Sunday. You walk into church. How does the worship service begin? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right away. It's telling you, hey, God's here. He says in the Old Testament, wherever I put my name, that's where I'm going to be to give you my blessing. You start the church service by saying, hey, God's here. This isn't some just lecture about some God who's up in Never Never Land. But God is here and he's here for you, to serve you, to dish out heaping portions of forgiveness, life, and salvation. He's here not even to forgive sins in the abstract. He's here to forgive your own personal sins. And how does he do it? Well, it follows right away in the worship service. He uses the mouth of the pastor. And instead of by the command, as I said today, I forgive you. Instead of by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a judgment that makes Satan tremble and shake in his shoes because Satan understands the name of God. When Jesus shows up, the demons, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And that forgiveness is spoken in God's holy name. It's done by the triune name of God. God is giving his name to you. He's giving his righteousness and his forgiveness to you. Same thing happens in holy baptism. Do you remember that? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God takes care of everything. The sinner set free from sin, death, and hell. Why? Because God's here. He's the one doing the work. He's here with his name. <clears throat> so remember, that, that, that big take-home point. Jesus is always here with his name. He's present with all of his benefits, all of his power, his wisdom, his treasure, his love, his forgiveness, his mercy. And how do we know that? It's 
because of his name. No wonder that Jesus said today, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. For God is always there completely giving himself and all of his gifts with his name. And so now, knowing that, it's time to shut the whole sermon down here today. We've come to a close. So that in a moment here, we can actually pray in his holy name. And so how do you think we're going to end this sermon? Well, if you've been following along, you probably know how it's all going to end. It's going to end in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now in the peace of God, the triune God that passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith in that holy name until life everlasting. Amen. This time then, I invite the congregation to please stand as the offering is brought forward. And as we sing the offertory, we give thee but thy end.
to uphold your creation, be with us as we still suffer under the curse of sin. By your will, grant healing to the sick, comfort to the lonely, relief to those whose hearts are heavy with grief, and aid to those who are in any type of need. Especially this day, we remember Kelly, Harold, Tim, Christine, Marlis, Nina, Jack, Ken, Joan, Mel, Ron, Bob, Charlie, Bev, Shirley, Jeff, Judy, Phil, Lucy, Roger, Donnie, Jeff, Stephanie, and Don. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And by the congregation in the priest stand and receive the blessing of our Lord. Once again, here's another opportunity to remember the Holy Trinity. It's taken from the Old Testament from the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord will be mentioned three times, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, especially with the second person, as now God takes on flesh and he makes his face to shine upon us. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for announcements. We welcome everyone this morning here once again in the name of the Lord as we can come here and remember that God gives us a great gift and that is His name. And where He is, that's where His name is put. He's there with all the blessings of life. And if we remember our own baptism each and every day as we are baptized children of God. That's our identity. Especially in the month of June, we need to remember that. Who are we? We're baptized children of God. Dearly loved by Him. And He knows us by name. More importantly, he's given to us his name. And we have access to him both now and forever through Jesus. And we give thanks to God for that. A couple quick announcements. Uh, this Tuesday, uh, the Board of Elders and Board of Trustees will meet for a joint meeting at 6. And then after that's done, they'll separate into their own board meetings. Okay. Then this Thursday is our final uh, Bible study on the book of Nehemiah at 9 o'clock. And then at night, the Women's Guild will be having a picnic at uh, Brenda's house. Details are there in your bulletin with regards to that. And then next Sunday is commissioning of our VBS, asking for God's blessing upon our VBS and volunteers during both services. And then we'll have a VBS planning meeting after the 1045 service. With regards to that, we still need a few donations here of various items that are in the bulletin. We've got a sign sheet out there if you'd like to help out with that. And then finally here, Sarah would like to come forward. She's got a little message here about the in-gathering, the collection here for the LWML National Convention will take place up in God's country, up in Wisconsin, up in Milwaukee, up here uh, at, the, at the end of the month. Thank you, Pastor. So in the bulletin is a little list of things that we're collecting. Um, we, there are several of us going to the convention in Milwaukee, and we're supporting the in-gathering that's for Phil's friends. I don't know if any of you have heard of Phil's Friends. They have a, a location in Crown Point, but they're based out of Illinois. But they provide boxes and support and cards for people who have been diagnosed with cancer. And personally, several of my family members have benefited from the boxes, the blankets, the hats, the gloves, the, the, the fuzzy socks. So in here, we're collecting, there's a box out there. You can bring puzzle books, fuzzy socks, um, journals, hats, any kind of hat, knit, crochet, or baseball. So I know all of us have baseball hats that we've never worn. Bring them in, put them in the box. Um, playing cards. And they also are taking Walmart gift cards. So um, that's what we're collecting for the National Convention in Milwaukee. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that our dinner at Brenda's on Thursday night, all women are welcome. We would love to see a great, great crowd there. Um, Brenda has a nice pontoon boat. We'll take a little trip around the lake. It's going to be fun. So please consider coming, and I hope that um, you feel invited. So thank you very much. Pastor. Thank you, sir. Well, have a good week here in the name of the Lord.
and we'll look forward to seeing you here next Sunday. We'll conclude our worship then here with our closing hymn today, another great Trinitarian hymn, 506, Glory Be to God the Father.